It's good to gather here today. We're putting a bow on Galatians. And I hope from being in Galatians, you have a greater understanding and appreciation and love of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also to see how easy it can creep in to still begin to do something to earn your salvation. So Galatians over and over again is saying it's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. And on this Memorial Day weekend before I pray, I'm mindful that we have brothers and sisters around the world in certain countries that can't freely gather to worship in their nations, in their towns, and in their cities. And here, obviously, we are able to. Now, part of that is because of God's providence and his sovereignty, but also he has used those in our military services who have given their lives to preserve our freedom. So we are mindful of that today as we gather here. We don't worship America. We thank God for America. We're a grateful people and we thank God for those who laid down their lives uh, to preserve our freedoms. We're grateful for that. Also, our block party, our Let's Go Ground Blake Breaking Block Party is this Thursday, May 30th at 5.30 to 7.30. We're going to have food, going to have dinner, going to have fun. We'd love for you to be here to celebrate with our church this Thursday as we break ground, come together. Also, a chance for you to meet somebody new, see other folks from other services as we all come together to celebrate what God is doing here. And lastly, but also of significant importance, you saw the video from the Jacobs family earlier. It is Foster Family, Foster Care Awareness Month. Uh, one child, one of our community partners, one more child is out in the lobby. Uh, there's a chance to connect with them if you want to have interest in foster care. But also let's be praying to see how we can help foster care families in our church. A great need in our community that church members have stepped up to reach. And I want to make sure because of the churches in Tallahassee that foster care in our community continues to be a major need from all of our churches that we meet for the glory of God, and to care for those who are the most vulnerable. So let's pray together, then we'll jump in. Our Father, we are thankful for the book of Galatians. Several months in this book to see over and over again the story of what Christ has done for us in our salvation. Let us cling to Christ and boast in Christ. That also means anyone here today for the first time is still checking things out, trying to figure out the faith, that they can realize that you have done the work through Jesus. They don't have to earn your love. They don't have to earn your forgiveness. You freely give it to us in Jesus, and we thank you for that. As you speak through me this morning, as we understand this last chapter of the book, how Paul pushes the believers to go forward in living for you based on the news they have of their complete forgiveness and full assurance in Christ. As you keep the enemy out of this place today, as you keep all the churches in Tallahassee as they gather, Lord, let the gospel go forward from every single pulpit in our community. We also lift up foster care families, like the Jacobs family that now is an adoptive family, a family you have put together. Lord, I ask that our adoption in Christ will lead us to want to care for those who still need physical adoption and care here in our community and beyond. But also, you ask to be the ministry of one more child as they go forward in making our community a better place. Oh, Lord, we also lift up this Memorial Day weekend to you. As we get to have a day off from work, some of us, or enjoy the beach or the pool and friends, I can't imagine what it's like right now for some families, maybe families in this room, who have someone in their family who has given their life in service to our country through the military. So we ask that as we celebrate that we're mindful of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and the families who now to this day still carry the burden of what it means to have someone you love and care for make that ultimate sacrifice. So thank you for our country. Lord, we ask the name of Jesus runs through every city and town and church in this nation and that we're all mindful and we all push forward in our greatest need for America which is reconciliation to you. We need a spiritual awakening in our country. Lord, we ask that as we're thankful for our freedoms, that ultimately we will understand that the best freedom available is freedom found in Jesus Christ. Let us proclaim and boast in that today. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Galatians chapter 6. And I left my iPad in New Orleans. So I'm using physical notes today, so pray for your boy. Uh, Galatians chapter 6. I was teaching a seminary class about there, down there, but it's in the mail. Good news. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Again, Paul's putting a bow on this whole letter he's written. He's landing the plane. He says, brothers and sisters. So he's writing to Christian family here. The entire time he's writing to believers, helping them to see the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and its implications through our churches. If someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, as in they get caught up in sin, you who are spiritual, you who are walking with God, don't think monks here or like yoga when you think spiritual. He means those who are walking with God. Don't read too much into that word. You should restore such a person. That's our calling. Someone gets caught in sin. Our job is to walk alongside of them and restore such a person. How? With a sledgehammer? With a gentle spirit. That's how we approach a brother or sister who gets caught up in sin, who goes off track, who stops acting like they are a spiritual person. But then he reminds us, watching out for yourselves so you also won't be tempted. Tempted how? By a judgmental spirit. 
by a self-righteous spirit. That you'd be careful in pursuing someone who has fallen, and when you walk with them, that you don't fall into sin yourself by having the wrong approach to that person who is struggling. He says, here's what it looks like, verse 2. He says, I want you to carry one another's burdens. Like it is a weight, you're carrying them. Not patting on the shoulder, you're carrying the burdens, the struggles, the hurts, the pains, the wandering into sin of other brothers and sisters. In this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And Jesus said the way the law is summarized is by loving God and by loving your neighbor. And a way you can practically, functionally carry that out in your life is by carrying the burdens of other believers. For anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So if this is the mindset, you're not going to do the previous verse as well. Like if you think you're a big deal, you're going to be a bad burden carrier because you think everyone should only carry yours. That you're the one who's special. That you're the one who's unique. They just need to maybe get over it and move on. Maybe they should be more like me. They should be more like you. He says, no. You consider yourself to be something when he is nothing. He deceives himself. Remember for five chapters he's saying, we talked about our full dependence upon the Lord for salvation, our full dependence dependence on Christ, and not our efforts for reconciliation with God. He says, don't lose sight of that. Don't forget that because it applies to everything else. Our freedom in Christ, Jesus doing all the work, flows into every single other thing that we do. That's why the gospel is always relevant. It always relevant applies. So what we believe to be true about what God has done through Christ flows into every single other thing that we do. He says, here's what's important. Let each person examine his own work. Be self-aware of your life. Evaluate yourself. He says, then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. What gets us in trouble is we compare ourselves spiritually to other people. When I compare myself to God, then my pride goes away. And I realize my need for grace and also the need for to give other people grace and forgiveness. For each person will have to carry his own load. We'll see what he's talking about there in a minute it's like a contradiction. He's saying carry the burdens of others and then it says carry your own load. We'll unpack that. But the big picture idea here is that Jesus bore our burdens. Say that in your mind right now, that Jesus bore my burdens. And what is your biggest burden? Your biggest burden was the burden of sin, separation from God. Jesus, who was never separated from God, who didn't have sin, he stepped in your place and took on the burden of sin and its consequences for you. Jesus bore your burdens. It may seem like no one else does. Jesus bore your burdens. It may seem like no one else understands Jesus bore your burdens. And if Jesus is the one, then there's not a burden too heavy for him to carry. There definitely is for me to carry. I'm limited. There definitely is for you to carry. But there's never too much of a burden for Jesus to carry because he carried the greatest burden of all, the weight and punishment for our sin. So because he did this for us now, we're to bear for each other is what he's saying. Since Jesus bore our burdens, now if we're going to love our neighbor and love the family of God specifically, let's carry each other's burdens. It's a privilege in the family of God. It takes some sweat. It takes some pain. It can be annoying and frustrating because we're humans, but it's a privilege in the family of God to carry one another's burdens because Jesus carried ours. Rather than load someone, he's saying, with more burdens, for them it's the law, the demands of the law on their shoulders. He goes, we already have burdens in life. Why are you putting unnecessary more burdens on people's shoulders since Jesus already lifted that burden for us? He said we should practically do the exact same for one another. And a great way we can practice this is through showing grace and restoring people when they've sinned, when they've fallen. That's the example he gives. And the posture is humility, or he says we'll fall, we'll fall into sin as well. An important reminder Don't forget your own sin. Don't forget how much Jesus has forgiven you. And if you do that, you're going to have a posture of humility in restoring someone else. I want to make an important kind of clarity here. It's kind of common in our world today where if you get caught in sin and then someone, another Christian comes and confronts you about your sin and does it totally the wrong way, judgmental, rude, arrogant, makes you feel totally condemned, less of a person, like you have no dignity, like they're perfect and you're not, It's kind of a commonplace today, especially maybe online, 
to be able to think that because that person did that, they're the ones who are wrong and not you. But here's the truth. How a person treats you in your sin doesn't change the fact that you've sinned and need to repent of your sins. A person getting it wrong does not excuse you from the need to get it right. And the way we get it right is by looking to Jesus and his kindness, his kindness leads us to repentance, to turn from our sin and to turn to him. Remember that, how a person treats you in your sin doesn't change the fact that you've sinned. So get rid of the excuses is what I'm saying. Get rid of the yeah buts. What about them? I know the things they do in their life. They're not perfect either. Oh, I got a list. If folks only knew, all that might be true. It doesn't change the fact that you need the grace of God in your life. You need to turn from your sins and be forgiven. And how we keep from the sin of being judgmental or self-righteousness, which are sins, is to look in the mirror and see your own need for grace. And that will allow you to have the right posture of humility in restoring to the point where, what a goal, you're the person they want to know first when they fall into sin. Think about that. You're the person they want to call first because they know you're not going to bring condemnation, you're going to bring restoration because that's the goal of a burden carrier. When the burden of sin is on someone's shoulders, yes, accountability, there are earthly consequences for actions, but the goal for every Christian is to see a brother or sister restored in a right relationship with God functionally. It already is in our salvation. You can't lose your salvation, but how it plays out in our lives and in the fellowship of the church. In verse 5, we see this. He says in verse 5 that, uh, that he says that right here that for each person will have to carry his own load. So the context of one's own standing before God is what's happening here. He's saying, make sure you're right with God first. Make sure that you know that the biggest load that you have, the load of sin and death and punishment for sin, that Christ has carried that. And since Christ has carried your load, and that's already been established, now you can carry another person's burdens. So if you're carrying another person's burdens, when you still have this burden of sin in your own life, you're basically wasting your time. Because you're causing, you're simply helping to solve an earthly problem rather than most significant. Here's what Martin Luther said. Believers, just to all of us, should have strong shoulders and mighty bones. We're doing spiritual shoulder presses and drinking lots of milk. I told you as a kid. Strong bones. Why should believers have strong shoulders and mighty bones? Because we're called to carry the physical, everyday weight of our brothers and sisters. So we have to keep ourselves spiritually healthy so we can help others be spiritually healthy. Believers should have strong shoulders and mighty bones. Do you have strong shoulders for other brothers and sisters? Do you have mighty bones for strong for other brothers and sisters? And also, do other people have strong shoulders for you? Do other people have mighty bones for you? It's easy to always be the carrier and never let anyone actually carry for you. We need each other. It's both and. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for guidance. Don't be afraid to admit wrong. Don't be afraid to admit your struggle. Because God already knows. It's okay if they know, even if they have the wrong reaction. Because God already knows. I want to get to the point in my Christian life, I'm not saying I'm there yet, where I'm more concerned about the fact that God already knows than I am that somebody else might know. Again, I'm not saying I'm there yet. If you're there already, please coach me up. <laughs> That's a hard place to get. But we've got to be burden carriers and also let other people carry our burdens because that's how the body of Christ serves each other. That's why I recommend being in a city group or in a Bible study, getting to know people through serving teams, having some sort of fellowship. It doesn't have to be 15 people. It can be just one in your church family specifically that God has given us. He's writing to a church here, brothers and sisters in a local church in Galatia that can help you to carry the burdens of this life, but also to make sure you're not carrying the burden of sin that Jesus already died for. There's still not a reality and a problem daily, habitually in your life. It says this in verse 6, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. I want to shout this out to our culture right now. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. You can celebrate all the things that he's against. You can be against the things that he celebrates in his word. But ultimately, he will not be mocked. 
For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. And the world uses that verse. Isn't it interesting how unbelievers often know some Bible verses? They know don't judge. That's their favorite. They know honor your father and mother and their parents, because they bust that out a lot. And they know the whole sowing and reaping understanding. It says, because the one who sows to his flesh, Jake last week talked about flesh versus the spirit, how there's a conflict happening, our old life versus our new life, will reap the destruction from the flesh. The flesh is unforgiving. The flesh is a predator. It wants to take you down spiritually. More and more burdens on your shoulders to make you collapse. That's what the flesh does. The one who sows to the spirit, as in the things of God, will reap eternal life from the spirit. That's where we find our hope. And he tells them this. What amazing words for us. This is so important. It seems so simple, but it's so important. Let us not get tired of doing good. It's worth standing for truth. It's worth loving your neighbor. It's worth being generous towards the mission of your local church. It's worth carrying someone's burden. It's worth saying no to sin and yes to God. It's worth taking that awkward risk and sharing your faith with somebody who you know needs Jesus. Don't get tired of doing good. He's writing to a Galatian church here that is weary. They're fighting. There's conflict happening. Is it circumcision and you're made right with God or not circumcised? Or do you not have to be circumcised and you're right with God? Is it Jesus or also the law? There's fights happening. People are leaving the church. They're weary. There's real conflict happening here. He says, hey, those of you that are standing for the truth, you're not the ones being divisive because you're not the ones who have moved. It's those who depart from, yeah, you can have a divisive spirit and still be right in terms of the truth. We want to reject that. He talks about that here in this text. But oftentimes we think the ones holding for orthodoxy and holding for truth are being the divisive ones. No, those people didn't move. It's those who depart from it that are being divisive. Don't be tired of doing good. I know you're worn out. Don't be tired of doing good. For guess what's going to happen? If we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. That saying the Christian life is a journey is not some kind of cliche. It is a long game. Eugene Peterson, the author and pastor, called it long, slow obedience in the same direction. That doesn't sound glorious, but he's saying it's worth it. Because we will reap at the proper time. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of God. Yes, care for everyone. Yes, we love the world. We love our neighbor. Yes, yes, yes. No disclaimers. But our greatest responsibility is to those in the family of God. So at our church, even, we have a ministry set up that help people who are members who are in need. When it comes to maybe their finances, when it comes to widows, when it comes to orphans, the things the scriptures talk about, we take those things seriously to care for people who are in the family of God. We have a deacon ministry here of just very, uh, just committed church members who see needs and meet needs, become aware of needs and meet needs any way they can under the context of the umbrella of our church. Why? Because we have an opportunity to help those who are in need in our own spiritual family. So what's happening in chapter six, back in chapter five, we see like Jake said last week, it's like a battleground. Like spirit versus flesh, old self versus new help, new self. Kind of a tug of war going on. Who I am now versus who I used to be. Here on this side of heaven, we're still going to have those temptations. We're still going to have those struggles. Maybe those old cartoons, I'm dating myself here. 8.30, probably a little older crowd, maybe. I'm dating myself here. But in the old Saturday morning cartoons, you college students are like, I should be on vacation right now. What are you talking about? They would have a, so here's a character like Bugs Bunny. And he would have a conflict. Do I do the right thing? Or do I do the wrong thing? And all of a sudden, an angel would appear on his shoulder and go, Bugs, do the right thing, playing a harp. And a devil would appear on the other shoulder and be like, do the bad thing, do the bad thing. And a conflict would take place in his mind over what now he's supposed to do. The spirit and the flesh tug of war is kind of like that. It's old self whispering in your ear, do this, believe this, affirm this, compromise here, cut this corner. Or your new self is saying, no, here's who you are in Christ. Jesus is Lord. He's made you new. God is the one who loves you, not the things of this world. It's like a battleground. Well, chapter 6, the image he gives instead is more of a, think of a country estate or maybe a plantation like on the way to Thomasville. And he paints the flesh and the spirit as two fields. 
So think of a property, maybe side by side, maybe on the way to Thomasville, two massive fields. And he paints those as two which we may sow seed. And he's saying our spiritual lives are going to depend on one major thing, where it is we're actually sowing. You could say for his analogy here, what field are we sowing in? Are we sowing to please the flesh or sowing to please God? Like that's the daily question for the person who's already been forgiven, who is loved by God and knows God, is to ask yourself the question, where is it I'm sowing? Basically, God's field or the world's field? The things of the spirit or the things of the flesh? And the whole reaping what you're sowing thing, he's not saying that what goes around comes around. That's not the point here. But rather asking the question, why does it seem like you're unable to live for God? You might believe these things, but why aren't you actually able to like, make it happen in real life? And the answer he would say here is because you're sowing to the flesh in that field. That's where you're planting every single day. Am I going to plant myself in the things of this world, its values, its understandings, or am I going to plant my life in the things of God? And one of the greatest ways you can plant yourself into the things of God, this, I'm not saying it's come a pastor because I have a whole Bible in front of me instead, it's through the local church, being a part of it, making a priority in your life where you can be encouraged and hear the scriptures and be informed and be prayed with and prayed for and sing the songs of the faith. Often take the Lord's Supper, come together in community to keep planting your life in the things of God to then propel you to go live for Christ in the workplace. I was in the airport uh, last week, and I was flying back from Chicago where I was speaking at, at Wheaton College up there at a, at a pastor's conference. And I, we were in line at the restaurant at the airport, and it's like, you always feel bad because there's like a table for four, and you're by yourself. So I just kind of always feel a little bad, like taking a table, like the waiter's going to hate me, I'm going to sit in this table, and there's people waiting in line. So another guy and I started talking, and we were like, he's a total stranger, and he was like, do you want to just get a table together so we're not taking up too much space for just one of us? And I was like, sure. And I'm like, Lord, like, won't this guy be a serial killer or something along those lines? So we sit down together. I guess I'm safe in an airport restaurant, but, and we're just like, it was like, it was like, it was like a like, like speed friendship kind of thing. You know, we sit down, it's like, where are you going? Where are you from? And he is one of the vice presidents of Whole Foods. And I hear that and I'm like, oh boy. I'm a pastor of an evangelical church. We're going to be buddies, you know, and, and, um, and I was like, okay, I said, that's really cool, man. I, that, I said, I actually go to Whole Foods a lot. I like it there. And, you know, and uh, my buddy Matt Tharp and I meet there for lunch and, and all those kind of things. And we're kind of talking back and forth. And he goes, I'm not, he asked me what I did for a living. And I was like, crap. I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm like, here we go. And I said, I'm a pastor of a church. He goes, dude, no way, I'm a believer. And I said, are you for real? He's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I and mean, he told me the church he's a part of in Maryland. And, he's, and I said, let me ask you a question. How is trying to live for Christ in Whole Foods, like working there? He goes, honestly, man, it's really hard. But that's my mission field. So that's why my church and me reading the Bible and praying and having Christian friends is so important to me. He's like preaching a sermon for me right there. I'm like, this is great. Because I'm trying to live for Christ and be a missionary and be a light here where I work. And I'm like, man, I told him, I said, man, I am convinced, and I tell our church this regularly, we need more people like you in spaces outside of Christian spheres. We need more Christian teachers in our schools and more Christian nurses on hospital floors and more Christian engineers and more Christian construction companies and more Christian physicians and we need more Christian people working at Whole Foods and everywhere else. But you're not going to be able to survive those very tough secular environments where you probably do get discouraged all the time unless you're regularly sowing in the field of the spirit rather than the field of the flesh. You have to have that lifeline of sowing in the things of God and what he's provided for you. He's given you his ear through prayer. He's given you his mouthpiece, the scriptures. He's given you his body, the church. And when we lean into those things, it then propels us to live for Christ. We need more Christians in government. We don't need Christians in government to hear from their church that politics is bad and politics is this. No, politics is good if it's done for the glory of God. We need Christians in those spaces. We need more Christians on dorm floors at Florida State and in sororities 
Like, we need more Christians in those spaces. And I was so encouraged. I meet this random stranger who's a vice president for Whole Foods and is trying to live for Jesus in that context, just like you are wherever it is that God has you at this moment. Are we going to plant our things in the flesh, our life in the flesh, or in the spirit? Romans 8, 6 says this. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. What a contrast. How many folks outside of these walls right now, including those in these chairs, are on this life quest for peace? God says it's provided for you in Christ. Sow your life there. What's the difference look like? In 1 John, he talks about the struggle of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh basically says, I want to feel that. I want to feel what they have. I want to feel accepted. I want to feel known. I want to feel loved. And the lust of the eyes says, I want to have that. That status. That notoriety. That stability. So what happens when we have a lust for the flesh and a lust for the eyes, I want to have that, I want to feel that, as we now live for those desires. So we're going to sow in that field of faith. Or are we going to sow in the field of the Spirit? He says in Colossians 3, so if you have been raised with Christ, which is every Christian, every single Christian has been raised with Christ, that happens at your salvation, seek the things above where Christ is. This is what it looks like to plant and to sow in the spiritual field. He's seated at the right hand of God, and he's the one who's ruling and reigning. He's the exact one he claims to be as a reminder. And because of that, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things things. He's not saying to vacate your earthly responsibilities he's given you. That would actually not be setting your mind on heavenly things, because the one in heaven has given you the gifts you have, the situation you have, the calling on your life, the the call to provide for your family, whatever it could be. So I want to do that for his glory. But also believe me, it's not ultimate, because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. He's ultimate. Then he closes the letter by saying this, and it was common back then to have someone dictate for you, So Paul would say it out loud, and he'd have a scribe who would write it out. He says, look at what large letters I use as I write to you in my own handwriting. Paul said, this is significant, in other words. And some think that he was writing here in large handwriting because of people being able to see better. Paul didn't have good eyes himself, but most scholars actually believe he's trying to make a point and have emphasis. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. And they don't really believe that. They're trying to give their own lives ease and comfort. They're lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. So they're doing whatever it takes to be accepted by them. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves. They don't follow all of it. And yet they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh, to say, look at me, I'm spiritual, I've been circumcised, I follow Jewish law. He says, but as for me, I've been on a journey, he's saying, I used to be those people who despise the gospel. And I'm still tempted throughout my life to still think it to keep Jewish law in order to be a Christian. He goes, but as for me, I'm, I'm never going to boast about anything. I've tried it all, except the cross for our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters is a new creation what Christ does in our hearts. He's saying, hey, hold on here. You who are refusing to give in to the demands of circumcision, that doesn't save you either. Just because you're holding strong and rejecting the false teaching does not mean that makes you right with God. Jesus makes you right with God. How easy is it to think that, it's easy to go that you're saved by what you, it's easy to think that you're a sinner because of what you do, like what you do wrong. But how easy can we miss the entire point by thinking we're made right with God by what we actually do? No, we're made right with God by Jesus, not by not doing or doing the right things. There's two questions he's asking here. Number one, is the Christian experience inward or outward? You might go, well, it's both. Well, the implications are both. But the Christian experience is one of the heart. Yes, it works out into all of life, but the experience is not an outward, I'm going to get circumcised and that makes me right. I'm going to clean the outside of the cup rather than the inside. 
as Jesus warned about. He says he's going to circumcise our hearts, change our hearts, make our hearts new. The Christian life is first and foremost an inward experience. That does not mean you have your own private, independent faith apart from everything else. It's not some mystical experience. No, it's a work of the heart. And the second thing, is the Christian experience human or is it divine? Is it my effort or is it Christ? And I think the scriptures make clear over and over again that it can't be both. Because if I get any credit for it, then I can't fully boast in Christ. I can say, hey, thanks, Jesus, for helping me out. But Ephesians says we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, not by any effort of our own. He says so that nobody can boast. He's saying, I boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Christian experience is all divine. That God is the sole agent. He's the one who does all of his work. And that should encourage all of us because it means you've, maybe you felt like you failed before in your efforts. And I would conclude that's the point because Jesus never failed. So all the Christian life comes from him, his sovereignty, his working, his action, his grace, his death, his blood for us, his resurrection, his ascension, and one day he will come again and make all things new. So what matters is not what you do and what you don't do. What matters is a new creation. And he has given to us that in Jesus. And now because we're new creations, now we're free to go live our lives to the glory of God. We believe that sowing in the spiritual field is better any day of the week than sowing in the spirit of the field of the flesh. And that's Galatians. Next week, we're going to start the book of Joshua and be in it for the summertime. So I'm looking forward to that as well. A little New Testament, a little Old Testament, and spend the summer together understanding this important book. So I always think summer kicks off Memorial Day weekend. So here we go, summer, and uh, let's go full speed ahead. We might take some time off in our lives during the summer from certain things, but the church does not. Uh, we're going to keep rolling and hope that you're a part of that and commit to sowing your life in the spiritual field.